Okay, so the second thing I wanted to talk to everybody about is uh, everybody's familiar with what happened in Paris recently, uh, and it's a it's just one of many incidents that have been plaguing the Ummah one after the other. And every time something like that happens, we're put in a position to have to respond. Right? And I, you guys probably know I've responded, Shaykh Omar's responded, Shaykh Abdul Nasser's responded to these incidents with khutbahs, talks, every time they happen. And it's become pretty much exhausting because we say the same thing over and over again. It's not like we have anything new to say. We are against it. It, it's absurd, it's an insult to our religion, it's against the fundamental teachings of, of Islam, uh, but yet again we feel pressure every time on having to respond to these incidents, and what do we, how do we think about this as an ummah, how do we think about it as a, you know, as a group? I've been in some strategy groups and some other kinds of discussions with other academics, not just Muslim scholars, that are trying to look at the problem of violent extremism, and so I'll frame this discussion a little bit before I take you guys as input, inshallah. So basically, the, what, what I found the most comprehensive analysis was that people that turn towards extremist behavior, violent behavior, there are multiple factors. So one factor is their grievances. Maybe they have a political grievance, they have a problem in their country, they were treat, mistreated or they were, they, were, they were exiled or they were turned into refugees, whatever happened to them. Like some, something wrong was done to them or maybe it's being done to them for a long time. Right? And, and th that's why now they are prone to respond and retaliate in ways that you may or may not find reasonable. But that's been the case for them. They have these unaddressed grievances. That's one problem. The second set is actually people that don't have these grievances, but they have other socio or uh, psychological problems. So you have young people that have depression, uh, that, are, that have low self-esteem, that are online for eight, 10 hours a day, even though they live in a na nice neighborhood. You know, and they have high-speed internet, so they can have eight, ten hours of internet a day on the computer. But like they're, they, they see, they feel very low worth for themselves, and this kind of these kinds of ideas make them feel very powerful, like they're finally in control of something, right? And it gives them a chance to be angry not just at themselves but at the world, right? And it, it psychologically transfers some of that anger that way. So an angry reading of Islam, an angry reading of like, you know, how we're going to destroy, like, Islam will come and dominate and crush everything in its path and you're going to help us do it, you're, only you can do it, etc, etc. It's a very empowering thing for people that have very low self-esteem. So they become, young people become very easy prey to that sort of thing for psychological reasons, social and psychological reasons. So the first is kind of political and the second is social and psychological. The third piece of this is actually, um, you can call it brainwashing, but there are groups, elements, out there that are very smart. They know where to start someone, like what to expose them to first, and then how to take them from there to step two, to step three, to step four, to step five, to turn them into a super crazy person. And so this kid was totally normal five, six steps ago, but they know how to take them gradually up a scale of aggressive thinking to the point where, and I've met these kids, I've met kids that have gone down this trajectory, when they're halfway through this trajectory, they are trained that anybody who tries to refute you or correct you is actually a hypocrite. It's shaitan coming to get you, stay strong. So they block everybody else out, right? And so they, they learn to block their parents out, the imam out, the scholars out, everybody out, because now the truth is only coming from this one source. So this is a very important piece of this. And there are people, very smart people that are behind this kind of machinery. A lot of money is put in this kind of machinery, right? So there are these three different factors. There is the political side of it, which I don't know if I can do anything about. There's the psychological side of it, which we can do something about. There is the religious rhetoric that's used, systematically used, manipulated. Now, I'll, I'll start this off and I wanna hear from you guys. Some data analysts that I talk to, you know what they've come to? They've arrived at the conclusion that, you know the signs of Judgment Day? Like the, the coming of the Mahdi, Isa alayhi salam, you know, the black flag, all, all of that stuff, that that is the most common way for a young person to get on a track where they don't want anything to do with life, they don't want anything to do with their career, or college, or family, because the ummah is about to clash with Dajjal, so we need to make hijrah, and we need to go fight some, someone or something, because the world's coming to an end, and I better pack my bags. Right, and that's the first subject if you get, and it's a very powerful subject, and if you guys even watched a, a video or two on the signs of the Day of Judgment, you get scared. You're like, oh my God, did you see the dollar bill? It's got this, this, this. There's a one eye on there. The jaw's in my pocket. 
You know, like, <laughs> you know, the minions. <laughs> you know, it starts messing with, this stuff really starts messing with you. And then you start becoming like conspiracy theory on top of conspiracy theory where you don't want anything to do with society, right? So there is a side, there's, there is a part of this where Islamic studies, Islamic subjects are used, or I would say misused, to head people down this path, right? And these are the two areas where I think we can do something. A lot of times we spend all of our energy talking about the political grievances and doing protests, but the problem is we've been pro doing protests for 70 years, right? And we, we, like, that's fine, we can do them, but there are other areas that we're ignoring. And if we continue to ignore them, we're gonna get a bigger and bigger problem. You know, because that's, that's where the supply chain is, that's where the real victims are. These are not criminals, to me these are victims. These are 18, 17, 16 year old victims that get manipulated, you know? And I want some of you guys' thoughts on this too, inshallah. All right, so for me, it's, it's multifaceted. Number one, I think we should refuse wholeheartedly to accept the narrative that people read the Quran and the Sunnah and become violent as a result of that. Yeah. I don't think that's the right narrative. I don't think we should su subdue ourselves to that narrative and say, yeah, you're right, we should take responsibility for that. However, when a person has gone through the other filters that you've mentioned, then at that point, religiously inflammatory messaging can become far more dangerous than any other form. That religion is a powerful tool. Religion is a powerful tool. It can turn people in many different directions. However, it's not, we should not treat it as an isolated thing because that's the narrative that Islamophobes want to push on the people that ignores. So even, even the, the Paris bombers, uh, as they're talking about their lives now, you can already see these are really, really unstable homes. I mean, the first guy that they interviewed his family, his dad said, he was a devil and I'm glad he's dead. Can you imagine a father saying that about his son? He was a devil and I'm glad he's dead. So you're already talking about, I mean, the Boston bombers, we saw with their families immediately disassociated and said, they haven't talked to us for years anyway, and so on and so forth. So we can't accept that narrative. When it comes to religious rhetoric, and what we have to take accountability for and responsibility for, look, black and white messaging is not good. Even black and white messaging that, that makes a distinction and says, no, you know, it'll say everything evil about this person, but we're not gonna make takfir of this person. We're gonna call them deviants, we're gonna call them innovators, we're gonna say this about them, this about them, no, no, but we don't accept uh, disbelief and we don't expect, uh, ac accept people to be killed. But you've created a black created and white hatred world already. in that person's head, eventually they're gonna flip and they've, they've learned to hate you, I, you, so much that we're getting death threats from them. Right? And that, yeah, their, their initial teachers told them that we were deviant and told them that, you know, that they shouldn't listen to us. But eventually they created such a hatred for people and created such a, a black and white world that eventually the t they, they went off the tip of the iceberg. So Wait, people we, hate me? <laughs> I just realized you said that. I wasn't paying attention. You okay, I'm kidding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but I do, do want to also add here, look, for everyone that's here, learn to be productive. Learn to be productive. What is productive is usually not exciting. Strategy, if any of you have ever been to anything, have, any, have ever strategized in any profession, it's usually boring, it usually seems too slow, it usually seems too calculated, and it seems too long term. Learn to be productive. I was having this conversation with both of them, and, and you know, we were talking about BDS, for example, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement. How many of you have heard of BDS? Do you guys even hear of that in Singapore? Okay, BDS is a, is a non-violent, is a global non-violent response to Israeli apartheid. It was not started by very religious Muslims. It's only a, a decade old movement that has been endorsed by the Presbyterian church that, is, that they have Jewish organizations that have endorsed and so on and so forth. The Muslims were the last to jump on this bandwagon and some of them are still not convinced because it's not exciting enough. There's, no, there's not enough bloodshed and so on and so forth. And it is, it is the most efficient, from a statistical perspective, has been the most efficient political response to Zionism. But it's not exciting, right? It doesn't have all the, all the bells and whistles when we read all the glorious stories of people in the past. Al-Iz ibn Abdul Salam rahimahullah ta'ala when he talked about, uh, when he wrote about um, you know, the topics surrounding jihad and so on and so forth, he said that one of the problems is that it becomes more, it becomes about your own maslaha versus the maslaha of the ummah. It's your own benefit versus the benefit of the ummah. I'm going to go to this place and do this because I've been terrible and I need to find a way to redeem myself. And I don't care what that does for the ummah. 
what good comes out of these actions? Let's say, that, let's say that you were able to pull out some weird interpretation and say these things are justifiable and they're legal and they do this to our women and children so we can do this to their women and children. Tell me what benefit it brought to the ummah. Our families are being threatened, we live, we're, we're, our da'wah is hindered. I mean, and look, the Prophet ﷺ was concerned about public perception and, and you know, let's face it here. He said that he did not kill Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salud, who committed treason over and over and over again for nine years, wreaked havoc. He said, why? I don't want people to say, to have material to say that Muhammad used to kill his companions. The Prophet was concerned about public perception. It kills our da'wah efforts, it kills our ability, it puts our families in danger, it hinders every single good. What benefit comes out of this, even if you were to some way pull out of, pull out of wherever, that this is halal, that it's justifiable to kill innocent civilians in response to your own innocent civilians being killed. If anything, it feeds the machine. You give them excuses. That's why Islamophobes love it whenever people actually fall and succumb to this stuff. They want that. This clash of civilizations is exactly what they're calling for. It's not smart. It's exciting. It's about you. It's selfish. It's about your own personal redemption or your sense of redemption for the terrible life that you, you've lived, as opposed to actually taking the ummah to places. And that long-term versus short-term vision, now with the Prophet it was Hudaybiyah, right? The Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Some of the Muslims didn't want a treaty, but that treaty was called Fath by Allah. It was called the conquest by Allah. Islam thrives in, in peace. Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, Islam spread through al-Hujjah wal-Burhan, la bis-Sayfi wal-Qital. It spread through intellectual proofs. It spread through convincing people and mannerisms and so on and so forth, not by the sword and by murder. That's what the Islamophobes say. And we sit there and we say, yeah, that's exactly how it spread. You know, we, we, we respond and we basically give credence to their call. So what good comes out of these different types of things, even if you were to able, to, able to justify them, which you cannot textually do anyway? I, I will say this, uh, and I want to hear from you, Andrew, in a sec. Um, when it comes to our th the way we think about ourselves and we, the way we think about Muslims and their relationship with the rest of the world, for a lot of Muslims, the, way, the things they've heard their whole life in khutbah, talks, whatever they let, read a little bit, they do start thinking that there's a clash, that it's us against everybody else. And there is bound to be some kind of conflict. We're not, we can't harmoniously exist with the rest of the world. Right, so these things are bound to happen. They're always going to hate us, they're always going to get us, that kind of thing. You know, And this narrative, this kind of thinking, I believe is actually very like, it's really unproductive and it keeps the Muslims from being what they're supposed to be. Muslims are supposed to be the, you know, khayra ummatin ukhrajat lin nas. Best of people derive for humanity. Like for example, the Muslims are supposed to be, if they're, if they're a minority in Singapore for example, everybody here, every non-Muslim here should know that if they were to ever need any help, they can turn to a Muslim. They should know that. They should know that if someone they can trust, it should be a Muslim. If someone they can rely on, it should be a Muslim. Like they, they, that's our job to establish wherever we are. That's our job. Our job is not to establish those people are najas, those people are filth, they're the kuffar, they're going to hell. Oh, by the way, I had a kafir sitting next to me on the bus the other day, and I was just talking to like, this is not the attitude. The attitude is these people, Allah Azza wa gave us this beautiful religion so we can share its goodness with everybody else. Not just in converting them, but also in them seeing that this spreads justice, fairness, kindness, courtesy, mercy. It spreads these things wherever it goes, you know? And we, we have to bring that narrative back because that is actually one of the, the fundamental essences of this ummah, is that it spreads goodness wherever it goes. About the issue of kind of countering, I guess you can say, uh, extremist ideologies, you, you said three things that were very interesting about the political or social grievances, the personal or psychological issues and problems. And then third thing was the messaging. Yeah. Um, and that's where, and I don't mean to just keep uh, using this as an opportunity for endorsements, but it's just, it's, it's an opportunity for us to be able to tell everybody why we do what we do. Right? Why we do. Not everybody knows what we do, but part of the thing is why we do what we do. And that's been a huge part of the consideration. That if you look at, if you look back at the earlier generations, you look at the first generation that the Prophet ﷺ trained and taught himself, the Sahaba, and then the next generation, you look that they had a methodology to understanding the religion. And that was built off of two primary 
resources. We say Quran and Sunnah, to, but, but to be more nuanced, right? It was the Quran, meaning understanding the application of the Quran within their daily lives. Number one, the relevance of the Quran to their lives. And number two, specifically within the Sunnah, there was a huge appreciation and understanding for what we call the Seerah. The life of the Prophet because then the seerah serves as the backdrop of the Qur'an. You see how the Qur'an is applied within real life. And that's why you see quotations from people like Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, the Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Um, you see these quotes from these amazing people in the generation of Sahaba and Tabi'un that they say that Kunna nu'allimu awladana maghaziya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kama nu'allimuhum as surah min al-Qur'an. We started teaching our children the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the seerah, just as we were teaching them surahs of the Qur'an. So there was this, again, I came back to that word that I talked about earlier, that kind of holistic approach of we're going to teach them these surahs and we're going to teach them the life of the Prophet and show how this surah applies in real life. I'll tell you something about that. Yeah. I'll tell you a crazy story. I felt like I was cheated. So I studied seerah first from certain books, the life of the Prophet and I read certain incidents and they, they, we coupled those studies in the seerah with certain surahs of the Quran. And I was taught certain lessons. And like, like one of those lessons was, for example, inna min azwajikum wa uladikum adu wa lakum fahtharuhum. That you know you're, you're from your children and your spouses, there are enemies for you, watch out for them. Allah wants you to serve the deen. And deen is for the akhirah. And your children and your wife, they are dunya. So put them aside because they're enemies for you and serve the deen. And they don't, you know, because th th this is dunya. If you're taking care of your kids and you're being good to your spouse, etc., that's dunya. But if you're going to do da'wah and you're going to, you know, study and you're going to go, you know, travel and this and that, this is deen, right? And this was taught to me through the Qur'an. Like the, the people that were perpetrating this were teaching this through the Qur'an. And I accepted it. I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't want dunya. I want akhirah. I want deen. I don't, I don't want nothing to work. You know, so you, so you want to abandon all of that because that's, and then you later on, when you decide that something smacks you in the head and you say, maybe I should study that over again. And you start studying it in depth yourself, you realize, wait a second, taking care of my family is deen. That wasn't dunya. That, who, what did, I just got cheated. I, got, I just got gypped. It's the same seerah, it's the same Quran, but there are some people that have such a deep bias and they teach it with that aggressive bias and they mess you up, right? And so I felt like, and I, I was so motivated to continuously study the Qur'an. And I, Wallahi al-Azim, when I study a surah, when I study like an ayah of the Qur'an, I make no assumptions. I, I assume that I don't know this at all. I'm gonna start from scratch because I know the danger of making assumptions <laughs> from before. I assume this is what the ayah meant and it led me down a bad road. I'm gonna let Allah's word dictate and the, 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 the word of Allah dictate and the research dictate where I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna put any suppositions on top of it, you know? And this is something that we have to le learn to do in the Ummah. There are a lot of things that we think about that have become part of our Islam that are actually not Islam. They're just not Islam and they're very harmful. And they're sitting there in our subconscious, you know? And they, they, they can become very extreme, inshallah. So, no. okay, uh, right. Omar, you wanna add something? Go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things as well, and this is sort of an advice for us all, I mean, I think that there are certain elements of our religion and when we try to ignore those elements altogether rather than understand them in a mature way and channel people's frustrations and grievances properly, we actually do a disservice. What that means is statistically speaking as well, those that are joining extremist groups are coming from groups that were completely politically quiet. Political quietism is what they call it, is the term that these are the types of groups. This trend actually leads people to the opposite extreme. Instead of saying, you have no right to be frustrated, you have no right to have a grievance, you should not be angry about what did the French bombed a, a school in Iraq and, or something and killed 28 children, that you should not be angry about this, you should not be angry about Syrian refugees. Instead, how do you channel that frustration into something that's productive, that's long-term, that's viable? Not, shh, don't talk about it. No, you should talk about it, it should hurt you, it should be something you think about, but it's not just the Facebook status people. You can do something about it, you know. I t in Dallas, I told them, we, you know, we had, we had Syrian refugees in Dallas. When, when, that, when that child washed up, 
at that Turkish resort. Well, like, that was a shame on the entire Ummah. That was a shame on the world. The level, the pitiful level, pathetic level that humanity has reached that you have babies washing up at resorts. And, and you know, we could scream about Arab nations and scream about nations not doing enough to accept refugees, but I was in Dallas, I was like, people, we have thousands of refugees here. Have you visited them once? Have you done anything for them? Have you supported those refugees? Have you given them a, you know, a, an, an outlook, a perspective on life? There are refugees at the border in, in Jordan. I've seen them with my own two eyes. They don't get squat. They have Christian missionaries there. They don't have Muslims there. Why aren't we doing anything about that? So channel your anger and frustration in a way that's productive, not, not just these hyper angry statuses. And it's funny when people comment online, they say, well, what about this? You didn't mention this, you didn't mention that. It's not about mentions, it's about working. It's about doing something productive. You should care. You should have, a, you should have ghira in your heart when Masjid al-Aqsa is under occupation. That means something. But what good is it going to do for you to scream about it and shout about it? Become active within your own circles. Find ways to be productive and actually influence policy long term. No policy has changed in the interest of any group in history, at least not, not in the United States, as a result of short term lashing out. It's always been long-term, calculated, strategic, moving people in a certain direction, changing mindsets. Because even if you, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, you have to influence public perceptions. Politics moves in regards to public perception. When you have media dominated by people whose interests are in complete direct opposition to ours, then you have a tall battle. So you have to change people's mindsets. When people's mindsets change, politicians go with the flow. What are you doing to change public perception about the Palestinian cause and about the Muslim Ummah and so on and so forth? That is a productive way and that's more about the Ummah than your own self, you know, feeling great about yourself and feeling like you're a brave person that's changed the, the situation of the Muslim world.